Hello there and welcome back to another Wi-Fi Sheep video with me, Tom. Now, on October the 26th, just gone, Wi-Fi Sheep did its last major public outing of 2019, where we attended the RiscOS London Computing Show. Starting with a murky Saturday morning over West London, with the many buildings and landmarks of central London just visible on the horizon. The show was held at a local hotel, less than a mile away from Heathrow Airport, hence the constant stream of aircraft overhead. So let's take a look inside the show. This was just before it opened. And here is the Wi-Fi Sheep stand for the day. We have one of our BBC Micro Model Bs showing the latest build of Nanogang's My 8-Bit Platform project. In the centre, a twin slice Ident CE Pi powered unit. This was showing Wi-Fi Sheep video content from the channel. Here showing the review video I did about the homebrew BBC Micro game Wide Light as seen on the channel a few years back. The other side of the stand was the Micro 1.5 card kit machine running our own Wi-Fi sheet build of RiskOS. We also showed some of the fantastic and high quality sample PCBs sent to us from our partners at PCBWay.com. So this seems a perfect opportunity to remind you about the PCBWay third PCB design contest. That's right, the third contest is now fully underway and open to entries from all over the globe. If you've got a custom PCB electronics project, why not submit it by the 24th of April 2020 for the chance to win up to $1,000. In fact, there's a whole range of prizes and free gifts and benefits to be won, ranging from $20 PCBWay coupons to multiple cash prizes. Already entries have started to appear from all over the world, with projects ranging from simple diode kits to full computing systems and everything in between. So don't delay, visit pcbway.com forward slash project forward slash events forward slash third design contest dot htm for full details. Alternatively, links can be found in the description to this video. Good luck. Back to London and the show opened to the public at 11 a.m. Here we see a large 8-bit contingent of BBC Micros, courtesy of Richard Broadhurst and his homebrew gaming offerings. Later retro hardware was also present. Here an impressive audio MIDI setup featuring an early Acorn Archimedes machine. This was the setup in the second room with various displays and traders. One thing that caught my eye was an impressive display of ex-BBC TV Acorn graphics computers used to drive live on-screen displays such as the live Lotto Draw numbers. Now a regular contributor to Wi-Fi Sheep and that of the wider RiskOS world is Anthony Bartram of Amcog Games. Here's Anthony telling me about his latest creation available for the RiskOS platform. Uh, we're in a maze, this is a place like, slightly on Star, on a star Maze in BBC Micro. It seemed more logical to me that you had to shoot the um, jewels out of the asteroids. You see the pro avenue in the uh, some, some of them do, some of them don't. I can't predict it, that's what it's more fun for me. So you've got these little characters here, which obviously are. Uh, Shoot rather effectively, and we've got a vertical motion as well. Try and avoid being killed. And you have to get the required number of jewels. Got shield energy here. So you've got full rotation. So this is uh, using your 3D engine once again, is it? So it's based on, I've taken the code for um, Iron Field of Dead and I've added vertical motion and vertical collision detection. I had to extend some of the logic because there's a wider variety of graphics and there's different modes of play, like there's a little alien that launches uh, a homing bomb at you. And also you've got this sort of spinning thing here, so it's more complicated in terms of gameplay really than um, Iron Field of Dead. 
just explain just about how the actual model sprites we're seeing were actually created. So that's quite interesting. Well, so very simply, they're stop motion animated, right, against a consistent colour, and they're lit from a, a single light source. Then what I've done for some of the objects is I've um, I've enhanced it so the model which I have here for that, uh, I've added glowing eyes and the flame behind it. That's made of air drying clay. There's different materials. So they were physically built models, that yes. real objects that are real objects. Which so I have a lot of So yeah. unusual. Well, it, I thought it came with different looks of the game. And it, it's uh, otherwise, if you create something as a digital model, it looks like what it is, it looks like it's been a digital model that's been deformed and created. Now the only thing that people really thought was a had to be a 3D model, which is it's that spinning thing we just saw. There are a few things which are digital. This cube, for example, I can't really build that very easily. If I'm neon lights, maybe it's possible. Um, but larger, two things I found. This of junk. I mean, this is a classic uh, 1970s BBC uh, spaceship made out of, you know, bottles and hinges and various other things that I had to know. As this makes it with this sort of Tron-like world. Yeah. Like, ah, Jewel. That Jewel is from one of my daughter's toys, I think. I used to light it correctly and it looks um, sort of nice. Does it really good, yeah. I mean, I think what you're talking about is the aesthetic quality there in the, in the models that you wouldn't get if it was all um, 3D rendered. Exactly. It, I, I'm trying to evoke something that feels like if we had the processing power, you could have had the 80s or something yes. like that. Same with the music. The music is actually largely very analog, um, although there's digital elements to it as well. I get all the jewels. I like to find some asteroids. I seem to be fighting things a lot. But yeah, obviously you can jump forward levels if you know the code. So very red, red So it, it, much like on the top, you've kind of got an alternative view of the game, which is how it would have looked in the 1980s, yeah. probably. Um, and it much like thrust or um, or asteroids, you keep going in the direction you point. And the difference is, is you've got height. So yeah, it's quite, it's quite good fun, really. It's quite nice how everything rotates at different angles. You've got a real sense of a, a three-dimensional space. So where is this available? This will be available for the Plink store to buy. And at, at, at uh, the risk of our shows as well. The price is £12 because it's a little bit hard for me to do 3D. I have this and maths and things I don't yeah. have to do. Something like Escape from the Arcade, which is the previous release, took about four days and this has taken quite a bit longer. So if you want to find out more about AMCOG's latest creations, you can follow the link in the description to this video. Talking of games, here's the latest port of Doom for the BBC Micro done by Rob Coleman. It looks to be running really well and looks the part running on the veteran 8-bit machine. Dale Doodley made his first exhibitor appearance showing the development of his amazing 3D engine for Risk OS and BBC Basic. I also like the mock BBC Model B Pi case. This was the talks and presentation theatre where I among many others gave talks during the day. And a quick look at Risk OS trader Arcom and their new Pinebook Risk OS laptops the first proper manufactured RiskOS portable for a number of years. And it was at the London show that I was really privileged to meet Pablo Fernandez, who is an assistant lecturer at the University of Catabria in Spain. His delegation had bought some very interesting software which they had developed uniquely for RiskOS in order to help teach their students in the ARM instruction set and debugging of programs. Here's Pablo explaining more. We wanted something that could work with the ARM architecture because nowadays is, I think, the most famous for the students, the, uh, the most widespread, and it is still a RISC ar architecture with all its benefits. And RISC OS, it's a great OS, a bit unknown, I must admit, but it's a great OS uh, whatsoever. It was available for the uh, Raspberry Pi, and we could uh, use it with uh, in a standalone 
common way without requiring a separate PC attached to it. Um, we were able to use input output uh, devices with very low interference, so that was great. And it was available to be easy to change, so it was uh, a major plus because our students already know about it before taking our courses and definitely reuse it afterwards. So that's why we decided to, to go for it. But the debugging tools that we were aware of uh, did not suit our needs. We wanted something that would be um, easy to use, um, user-friendly, and the alternatives uh, were a bit lacking in that way. And we wanted something that was obviously free because our students may want to use it at home. And we would like to, and we wanted to encourage them to perform autonomous work. And the, the best way to do that was to develop a developer. So, so that's what this is. This is your own yes. software, effectively. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So um, it's very simple. As you can see, it starts with four windows by default. And if we want, well, I would like to show you a bit how it works. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So basically, to load the program, you just use the LD uh, command. If you have any doubt at any point, you can just type help, and it prints all the commands available with the syntax that they use. So it's a bit easier to, to know what it's doing. So to load the program, you just type ld and the name of the command which would be in the current directory you can also use a full um, a full directory if you if you want to do so yeah uh, so let's say for example this one and at this point you can decide whether you want to uh, run a single instruction multiple instructions the whole program you can place breakpoints if you want to just by clicking over the instructions to remove them you also have only have to click with the mouse wheel over them. Okay. Yeah. So if I, for example, if I do this and I ask it to execute the code, what it will do is stop when it reaches a breakpoint and tell so, so that uh, the user is uh, aware why the, uh, the execution has to stop. You can go again, for example, and in this case, as you can see, this, um, this user program is printing a, a message to the standard output. And to do so, the debugger automatically opens a new window with uh, the sole purpose to show the output of the user program so that uh, the user can distinguish easily what is shown by the user program and the comments that he or she is using. It goes the same with the data window. You can go back and forth. And here, clicking with the mouse wheel, will switch the default view, uh, showing the contents of the memory in words to half words or bytes. Oh, and okay. Back. Yeah, I was going to ask to just explain hex. So can you look at it in bytes? And exactly. Ah, okay. This is shown in yeah. hex, and yeah. you can uh, see a small a snippet of uh, yeah. what it would translate if it were ASCII. So, um, for example, if you have a string, it's easier to find. Yes. So I assume what we're actually looking at here is the ARM instruction set. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And also, would like to highlight that um, you can see at any point the contents of the uh, of the, the register. Yeah. Yeah, of the register set. Um, those that are highlighted here in this case, for example, in red, are those whose value has changed uh, since we started executing oh, okay. until it stopped. That's useful. Yeah. So okay. So in, in this instance, for example, that we reach a breakpoint and then went on. Yeah. Since this breakpoint, I mean, since this breakpoint, the address, the uh, registers whose value has changed are the first and the program counter, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also notice you've got flags. Exactly. In yeah. There as well. So yeah. Yeah. Because, That's great. Because it's easier. I mean, the CPSR yeah. is uh, is good to be shown. It needs to be shown, but uh, the flags cannot be easily seen in the values, in the hex values of the CPSR. Yeah. Yeah. So they are disclosed separately as well as the CPU mode. So could the likes of 
me get hold of this, or is this an internal product at the moment for the university? No, 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 no. quite the opposite. It's an open source uh, software project, so it is available in our in our website in the in a GitHub repo, so you can download it from there. Currently, it's only there, but we have plans to uh, release it in the upcoming weeks in the package manager, so that anyone can install it. So you can, excellent. That's what, and is it just a Raspberry Pi build, or would it technically could it run on other ARM um, hardware? Um, currently, it's the Pi, and we know that it works in the One B Plus. Um, we have tested it briefly in the P two and three, and it seems to work. But since it has not been as extensively tested, we used to consider them in in beta mode. Okay. Well, a huge thank you to Pablo for showing me that fantastic piece of software. If you want to find out more information, the program is called UC Debug and it's available for free to all Risco S Raspberry Pi users. And you can also find out more on their website. It's www.atc.unican.es. Also, shortly after that interview, I was given this fantastic little um, goodie bag full of all sorts of interesting things. So huge thank you to that. And I wish you all the very best with that software project going forwards. And that just about wraps up our coverage of this year's RiscOS London Computer Show 2019. Just a reminder that the talks and lectures from this year's show will be found on Leo White's YouTube channel. And you can find the talk that I did shortly in the talks and showcase playlist here on the Wi-Fi Sheet page on YouTube. I will be continuing to support the Stafford Raspberry Pi Jam, which continues well into next year. You can find all the latest events and details on their website. So that really is just about it for now. So thank you so much for your company. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will see you real soon right here on the channel. Until next time, bye for now.